Okay, the uh, video got cut off there, um, so continuing. Later that evening, the three of us took a train to a local seafood house. Misa borrowed a shamisen and sang a little ditty, while I gazed in silent wonder at her lithe fingers gliding over the strings at her, and at her smooth arms swirling, swirling under the cuffs of her kimono. Such a scene might have struck the casual observer as completely ordinary, and your readers will surely laugh at my smitten response. Yet living with Yura all these years had transformed me into such a boorish, boorish oaf that for me this elegance was truly a rare spectacle. You see, Yura is the kind of girl whose vulgarity and coarseness infects everyone around her. I had become like a day laborer who trudges down the road with this heavy load, totally unmindful of the wild flowers in the distance. Yet I didn't resent Yura for making me like this. She was the perfect complement to my inborn esprit esthétique, that self denying nature of mind that had by now begun to reveal its pernicious side, threatening me with annihilation. But wait, who am I fooling? Pretentiously invoking my ascetic spirit, I now run the risk of losing all credibility, lapsing into total gibberish. After all, what moral purpose did my ascetic spirit ever serve? And to what spiritual path was I ever committed? Thinking aloud, I nearly yelped these questions over the rooftops of the town, in fact, at the time I was no more than a fish drifting along in a semi-catatonic state, my head a bottomless sieve into which no morsel of thought could ever accumulate, let alone be refined into words. As I try now to account for this sad, sad state of affairs, all I can do is offer a series of histrionic speeches not even worthy of a third-rate actor flailing about the stage, spouting incoherent lines that echo hollowly like pebbles cast into the abyss, Perhaps the wisest thing to do at this point would be to put on a look of humiliation and bow out at once, but it's too late even for that. I've come too far to end my story here, and so I shall try to refrain from making any more of these sophomoric diversions and elaborations and continue without shame or reserve my story about this aimlessly drifting fish who somehow managed to survive. After parting with Misa uh, later that night, Yura and I walked home in silence through the dark, empty streets. Actually, I'm not even certain whether Yura was silent or not, or even if she was there beside me, for my mind was so in the clouds that... No, wait, in the clouds makes it sound as if I were lost in some lofty thought, but I can assure you this was not the case. Let me start over. Walking down the empty streets, I suddenly stopped in the middle of the road to take a deep breath. Standing there, I thrust out my chest and inhaled deeply. The night air flowed into my lungs like a surge of water. Even after my lungs had filled to capacity, the air continued to flow in, had the sake gone to my head, and spread rapidly throughout my body like some kind of divine revelation. How am I able to inhale so much air at once, I wondered. Whereupon it dawned on me, that's it, I'm a mere void, empty as a cavern, always have been, filled only with emptiness, devoid of essence, hollow to the core. My skin had already started to inflate like a sad balloon at this point, and by the time I realized what was happening, I was already well on my way to infinite expansion. Floating through space, I somehow managed to make it home. Finally, later that night, with Yura sleeping soundlessly beside me, I burst silently into air, dissolving into the blackness of night. And yet, all the while, I was mulling over the notion of stigmata the kind experienced by St. Francis of Assisi, whose faith in Christ was so great that the wounds of Christ appeared on his palms, the realization that I was a perfectly hollow vessel, a void filled with nothing, filled with the nothing, had now become the principal tenet of my new faith, and I had no patience for the insolent fellow who would ascribe this faith of mine to madness or dotage or blind zealotry. What I experienced there in the middle of the street was none other than an ineluctable manifestation of the divine. This divine nothing had penetrated me, made me its medium, subjected me to its will, but this emptiness was wholly unlike the purposeful emptiness expounded by the ancient Taoist philosopher Lao Tzu, Lao Tzu who wrote in chapter 11 of the Tao Te Ching, Clay is molded to make a vessel, but the utility of the vessel lies in the space where there is nothing. Rather, it was an utterly useless emptiness, a meaningless crack in the earth, a split in a tree trunk, a, a hollow cavity. 
The nothing had revealed itself to me in the form of my own emptiness, and so for me the stigmata could only mean the immersion of my corporeal shell into some void or hollow frame inscribed somewhere high in the ether. In short, it was my own imminent death that I had been mulling over, although I did not realize this at first. Little by little, the thought of self-obliteration descended upon me, lulling me into a dream-like trance. Now I beseech you not to taunt me with that odious word suicide, which is anathema for me even to write down. Not once did it occur to me to murder myself, as it were. Rather, I would somehow simply drop dead, spontaneously expire. The most crucial thing for me was that I remained perfectly conscious of my own annihilation as it was happening. The last thing I wanted was to make an easy slide into death through, say, a pill-induced slumber. That is no way to go. Whether it was a sword ripping through my flesh or a bullet plunging into my brain, I had to verify my own end through a clear looking glass and feel it every step of the way. Lightly tapping Yura's cranium as if to confirm its contents, I whispered softly into her slumbering ear. You poor thing. It's n I'm not such a mean old lecher as to throw you out once I've had my fill. It's just that I've been stretched so thin that there's hardly any room for you now. Can you blame me? I'm sure you'll get on fine without me. You'll stretch your merry wings and fly along. Perhaps my tapping had grown too hard, for just then Yura's eyelids parted. What? What did you say? I was having the weirdest dream. Can you guess what it was? I said nothing. She continued drowsily. Hamasan, her affectionate diminutive for Misa's lover Hamamura, had taken me to a movie theater in Asakusa or somewhere. It was just the two of us. Suddenly a man appeared on the screen. He was standing in the middle of a forest. His head was facing down and he looked as if lost in thought. Just then the camera zoomed in on his face and when he looked up, lo and behold, it was you. Hamasan cried out, get a load of that ugly mug, he's staring right down at us. Why don't you run on up to him and give him a kiss? I'm fine right here, I said. And besides, he likes being up there all by himself. He enjoys solitude. Then he stepped out of the screen and walked right up to me, glaring at me just like Conrad Veidt in The Man Who Laughs. You don't scare me, I said. What's the matter with you, anyway, trying to embarrass me in front of all these people? You know I only go out with Hamasan because you never take me anywhere. And when I asked you why that is, you started to beat me over the head with a broken branch you held in your hand. Beat me over the head. Alright. A silly dream, no doubt. But not without some basis in reality. I was, after all, always declining her invitations. And so she would often leave me behind to go romp about town with that brute Hamamura. Sometimes without Misa and would invariably come home in high spirits, blathering on about this new movie or that new EO restaurant. Listening now to this run-through of a dream, I thought to myself, without a trace of malice, I think I finally get it. Restless women like Yura are better off with a flesh and blood type like Hamamura than with a distracted loafer like me. Half in jest, I tried explaining this to her. You know, we're no good together. Next time you're in Asakusa, have that psychic take another look at you. If you tingle all over and have a salty disposition, it means your ideal companion is the wild boar. And Hamamura is nothing if not swinish. I'm sure the two of you will make a terrific couple. Perhaps due to the sedating effect of the midnight lull, my joke did not go over as intended, and Yura's expression suddenly stiffened. Is that what you've been planning, you've been plotting all along, to dump me onto Hamasang? Rising from the futon, Yura grabbed the glass beside the pillow and threw it against the tatami. The momentum sent the glass rebounding in the direction of the adjacent lamp, where it came precipitously close to hitting the crystal shade. I thrust out my hand to block it, but was not quick enough, and so the glass smashed against the metal strand, sending broken shards into my hand. Though there was only a minor cut, the blood started to run. Strangely, I felt no anger or resentment toward Yura. It's not that I had to suppress my feelings. It was that no emotions were being generated. Calmly rising in the eerie silence, I fetched a bottle of medicine from the cabinet and began dressing my wound, 
all the while brooding over my previous thought, which related neither to Yura nor the wound, but rather to my own impending death. At that moment, I must have appeared utterly empty and devoid of all human qualities, for Yura, startled into dumb, a dumb silence, could only stand there gazing at me, her irises slowly coming to a standstill, and in those eyes I caught a look of such terror it would make any man pale. Eyes that screamed at me accusingly, Lunatic! The next few days wore a semblance of tranquility. I was especially careful not to make any unnecessary sounds until I had seized my prey, death itself. Perhaps it was due to this that my words and actions had taken on a soft mellowness. I had even become a model husband to Yura. To occupy my time, I embarked on a project to rid myself of all the bad habits I had acquired over the years. First, I burned that notebook of conceited fluff. Second, I forbade myself from dabbling in poetry, even from being moved by the shapes of flowers and clouds. Third, I vowed to stop making grandiose gestures, speaking in a loud voice, using phatic interjections like blasted and damn it, and words that convey inadvertency like accidentally and unwittingly, so as to rid myself of all pathological affect. This was my new regimen a kind of rehearsal for my Im imminent extinction. In short, I forswore the use of all emotive and undeliberate language. In the hope of transforming myself into a vessel so perfectly hollow that it would make no sound when struck. Perhaps some of you will laughingly say that I'm a mere epigon of Sinon Seuse Obermann, that solitary dreamer who recorded his world-weary musings in his journal in time while pushing his grape-laden wheelbarrow on some farm in the French countryside. But let me assure you that that is not the case. For at the time, nothing was more nauseating to me than bloated passages such as this one from Letter 9 of Obermann. I have beheld the vanities of life, and I bear within me the fiery principle of colossal passions. I bear also the consciousness of the grandeurs of social things, and I confess to the philosophical order. I have studied Marcus Aurelius without any astonishment at his maxims. I can conceive the austere virtues and even the monastic heroism. All this can animate my soul, yet fill it not. The barrow, which I heap up with grapes and wheel at laser, sustains it better. It seems to carry my hours peaceably, as if this slow and serviceable motion, this measured progress, were adapted to the common habit of my life. Such pretentious claptrap about rustic wheelbarrows and monastic heroism strikes me as pure affectation, a cheap gimmick, and whenever I come across such sententious lines all spit and polish, I feel as if I have bitten into a lump of bitter food and can barely keep from retching. And at any rate, Yurda remained oblivious, as ever, to what I was up to during this period, which was, of course, fine by me. Then, on a day when I had plans to meet two friends in Tokyo, Yura and I left the house together. Not knowing when I'd be returning, I advised her to stay the night at her mother's place. As we said our goodbyes, I was seized by a strange premonition that something terrible was afoot, I reached out for an embrace, which she received matter-of-factly, apparently taking it to be another of my sporadic displays of affection. With a deft turn of the heel, she set off toward her mother's like a ship sailing for port. What poise, I thought, what watching the trailing wake of this proud little ship lithely recede into the distance. A fine figure she cuts indeed, I, on the other hand, a worthless louse, a nameless drifter, driftwood floating down the river, paralyzed by inaction, frozen by ennui, forever procrastinating, delaying the inevitable. But wait, what if, what if I were to get it over with right now, finish it all off once and for all? 
Suddenly everything clicked into place. I decided then and there to make this my last day on Earth. After meeting up with Mr. A and Mr. B, the three of us went into town for drinks and stayed out late into the night. One of them invited me to stay at his place. I told him I had some place to be. And he giddily assumed this to mean some brothel in the red light district. In no mood to rectify his misunderstanding, I simply muttered a few parting words and headed toward the boarding platform of my homebound train. Though the night's last train had already passed, the square in front of the station was still humming with people, and the streets were lined with ramen, yakitori, and oden pushcart vendors, around which men in hunting jackets and shorts, a typical fashion in this remote area, prowled. I entered some shady nearby tavern and ordered a beer. Not wanting to resort to alcohol to quell my nerves, I downed several glasses of water to sober up as I went over my plan. The plan was simple. To march straight along the railroad tracks and into the oncoming locomotive, flinching neither at its sheer enormity nor at the fierce roar of its wheels. It was essential that the collision not happen in a flurry. I must calmly and collectedly inch toward it. I knew the late night locomotive was due to pass by shortly. How many sleepless nights had I listened from my bed to the roar of that endless string of cargo coaches piercing the bottom of the night? I would simply stand on the steel frame railway bridge and, calculating my steps, pace back and forth as I waited for the train to come. Should the collision knock me off the bridge, I would... I would fall right into the swollen river, whose rapids are so fierce I would have no chance at survival. And in the unlikely event that the river should spit me out into the far sea to float away on its tides, then that would be my final glory. My fate was now sealed. If tomorrow the world regarded me as just another hapless drunk who met its sudden and unexpected end, then so be it. Marking the time, I exited the bar and took a taxi halfway up the tracks. Watching the cab drive off, I headed toward the bridge and continued a pace in the dim, cloud-obscured moonlight, thinking of nothing. The steel bridge suddenly emerged from the darkness, its frame coming into focus as I got closer. I could feel its sheer might expanding within me, a euphonic, pulsing sensation that dispelled all fear of death and the soft beaming of lamplight in the railway crossing lifted my spirits even further. Stepping onto the steel bridge, I was now all legs, legs that hovered over the shining river far below and scurried from one rail to the next. Breaking into a sprint, I reached in a single breath the middle of the bridge and stopped to sit astride one of its rails. There was nothing to do now but wait, and wait I did. For inexplicably, and here I am at a loss for rhetoric, the train failed to show. This was a turn of events that I had not anticipated. Was it a miscalculation on my part, or was it some problem with the train? The train goes by every night, without exception, between 2 and 2.30, yet the needle of my moonlit watch was already nearing the 3 o'clock mark. Nearly an hour had passed since I'd stepped onto the bridge. Dumbfounded and helpless, I continued to gaze down through the darkness at the river flowing below. Then an idea occurred to me. That's it. I'll drown, drown myself in the river. There's a hazardous area just up the way called the Devil's Abyss, where the current is so strong that a lousy swimmer like me could never make it out alive. But in the end, for whatever reason, I did not jump. Although fear had begun to set in, that was not what kept me from jumping. What mattered for me was not whether I felt fear, indeed I prefer to die in fear, but that I meet my death with head held high. Springing up, I made several steps, when I suddenly found myself sprinting away from the train tracks, slowing down only once I had passed the last girder and reached the opposite river bank. Gliding down the sloping bank, which felt more like tatami, I suddenly lost my footing and tumbled down the smooth belly of the bank to the water's edge, 
landing in a thick, putrid patch of weeds and clumpy grass. No sooner had the swampy water penetrated my shoes than my face was assailed by a horde of horseflies, mosquitoes, and gnats. From this filthy mire I rose and, like a dog, shook myself off, my skin tingling and crawling all over. The stoic composure I had hitherto maintained was now utterly lost. Leaping into the river at this point would amount to no more than a frenzied act of desperation, so I had no choice but to scramble back up to the bank. My entire body was now aflame, and hot beads of sweat spurted from my pores. Goaded on by the mounting chaos and confusion, I plunged headlong into the darkness. My clothes were muddied and torn, and I hadn't the slightest clue whether I was running through bush, field, or ditch. My panting breath and heaving heart echoed deeply into the silent night. Severed from all language, all thought, I was now a wild beast. How long had I lain there? Under that beat-up fence before coming to? The numbness in my souls had now seized every extremity of my body, and my eyeballs stung as if ablaze. Looking up, I saw hovering above me a small white mass that grew clearer as my pupils focused. It was a white hibiscus, superimposed over the whiteness of the dawning sky. A string of words promptly issued from my mouth, almost imperceptibly, and the realization of what I had said felt like a sharp pinprick. Leaping to my feet, I began to stomp about in a frenzy, seemingly with a strength not my own, for this string of words had come in the form of a sententious haiku. I was blindsided, double-crossed, by this sudden resurgence of emotive speech, which, despite all my efforts of suppression, had slipped from my lips like a long bottled-up sigh. For the record, I will transcribe this trite haiku, which makes me recoil in shame whenever I think of it. Aruku ichiya, fuyo no hana ni, shiro mikeri. Sauntering night on a hibiscus flower, the whitening dawn. I was speechless, beyond mortification. What had come over me? This was no less than an act of treason, that I should conjure up such a trite haiku on this night, a night that was supposed to have irrevocably sealed my fate. Now utterly exhausted, I fell to the ground with a thud, and like some dumb broad, lay there baffled and dazed, staring blankly into space. When I finally came to, the, eye, the sky was considerably brighter, though it seemed to me I had been asleep for no more than a few minutes. Still out of sorts, I got up and walked about aimlessly until at last I came upon a familiar path. On one side of the path were dry fields. On the other side, a narrow fence road stretched whitely into the brisk dawn. At the end of the road was a forest of pine trees. Beyond that, a line of houses, the first of which was Misa's. As I made my way down the path, I was suddenly struck by the urge to see Misa. Moreover, I, before I knew it, I was headed in the direction of her place. It did not even occur to me how odd it would be to show up at this hour and looking like I did. By this point, I was no longer steward of my own body. I had little say over where it would lead. Finding the front entrance to her house locked, I thought I'd follow the low tea tree fence around to the back door, which was already, oh, which was always left partially unlocked, and gently slide my hand through the slot and unlatch the chain. But just as I tiptoed toward the door, I heard a rattling of shutters, followed by the voice of a boisterous woman, then that of a jolly debaucher, debaucher and finally the yelping of a dog struggling to come out onto the porch. I instinctively crouched down and crawled under the fence to peep in on the scene. I shall now describe, without embellishment or adornment, exactly what I saw. First to appear was Hamamura, whose one clogged foot dangled over the veranda, his thick hairy shins jutting from his ill-fitting terrycloth robe, Next was Argos, 
his front legs stretched over Hamamura's knee, his tail wagging, and behind Hamamura was Yura, who sat sideways as she nestled up to his rotund body. Over her flashy yukata where she wore an undersash and a rough-lined haori. Indeed, this was a yura far more seductive and supple than any I had ever seen. Just how I managed to make my way out of there without being discovered, I'm not sure. But once I was a safe distance from the place, I broke into a mad dash. What I was feeling as I ran was neither anger nor shame nor anguish nor anything of the sort. I was in fact rather calm, if a tad bewildered, bewildered mostly by the thought of seeing their bewildered faces should they have discovered me. How humiliating it would have been to see their mouths drop at the sight of me crouched there, filthy, on the verge of collapse, vainly trying to shoo away Argos, who had sniffed me out. After stumbling through forest and field, I finally reached my place. Prying open the back door, I stepped inside, slammed the door shut, and collapsed with a thud. Lying there supine amid total darkness, I was seconds away from falling into a coma. In those few fleeting seconds, though, my mind seemed to be feverishly pursuing something, as if trying to ascertain the subject of its own thoughts. It felt as though some foreign entity had lodged itself somewhere in my brain, but this nebulous entity remained tucked away in the folds of my brain and was not to be dislodged by a few tired poles. I let the thought slip away. You may think my humiliating discovery had suddenly just transformed me into a fully new man, some hopeful chap who, thinking he had caught a tantalizing glimpse of the Abrascola Clova, heaven of radio, radiant light, was now ready to crawl his way back to the world of life and its paradise of earthly delights. But truth be told, never had I so thoroughly lost my desire to live or been so overcome by the feeling that life was empty and meaningless, a tiny speck in a vast sea. The more spiteful among you will insist that this feeling of emptiness is rooted in my overzealous attachment to life, my unreflecting devotion to this world. But by this point, such speculations were the farthest thing from my mind, and I had already drifted softly into sleep. What the... what on? As if lifted f from the bottom of a whale by a rope, I was lured back to consciousness by Misa's words, which gradually became discernible. I opened my eyes to find myself being gathered into her arms, our faces nearly touching... The sun rays flooding the room through the open door were blinding. What in the world happened to you? You look like you fell into a ditch. Now you know why you shouldn't drink so much. You're not hurt, are you? That she assumed my condition was the result of a night of excessive drinking spared me the trouble of having to explain what had happened. For some reason, it seemed perfectly natural to me that Misa should be at my place, and it never even occurred to me to ask what she was doing there. Unable to speak, let alone move, I finally managed to grunt, Fix me something, I'm starving. As if this were some magical incantation, my stomach suddenly began to convulse, sending a faint sound up to my esophagus. Unable to endure such pangs of hunger, I implored her to hurry. Feed me first, and I'll listen to what you have to say afterward. Now if you're going to have to now you're going to have to settle down. Rushing me like this isn't going to get you your meal any sooner. She went into the kitchen and began rattling the cupboard. Nothing here? Can you wait for me to boil some rice? No, that won't do. All right, all right. I'll get you I'll go get you something. The bakery is a bit far off. For is a bit far though. So you'll have to make do with something from that takeout sushi shop. Just keep yourself together till I get back. Finding myself alone, I put my hand to my forehead to check for the fever, but all I could feel was a deep throbbing in my arteries. Aside from the hot flashes brought on by fatigue, there seemed to be no sign of fever. 
This isn't going to make for much of a story unless I run a fever, lapse into delirium, and go wild on Misa when she gets back, I thought to myself, only to be immediately taken aback by my own, at my own nerve. Was it really me thinking such sordid thoughts? Or was something else doing the thinking for me? Sitting sit stiffly there at the table with chin in hand, I felt myself starting to resemble some sort of fiend. I glanced nervously about around the room, thinking there might be some baleful spirit trying to take possession of my soul. Just then an apparition of Yura's face stole past me in midair, though to my great annoyance it vanished before I could take a swipe at it. I felt an insuppressible rage well up inside me, yet by now I was so delirious, so faint from hunger, so incapable of thought altogether, that I decided it would be best to make peace with Yura and proceed as if nothing had happened. I resumed my prior posture and squared my elbows snugly on the table. Misa eventually returned with a packaged bundle of sushi in a kettle, presumably borrowed from the temple. I'm back, here's your food. Wiping the globs of mud from my fingers, I glumly began picking away at the cheap sushi rolls she had laid out on the table. Misa cracked a smile as if she brewed a kettle of tea beside as as she brewed a kettle of tea beside me. You're usually neat, neat as a pin, and now look at you. Your hands are black as coal, and that mug? There's dirt all the way up to the tip of your nose. Just what were you up to last night anyway? She whipped out a pocket mirror from her sash and thrust it up to my face. Buzz off. Now now you need not you need no need for you to get into a state. Come on, I'll fix you a bath. I can't stand to look at you like this. Getting that filth off of you is going to take more than a quick scrub. You're quite a nuisance, you know that? She had ev evidently called on the sexton for help, for I could hear someone's voice over the ring of the whale bucket. Our bath if you could call it that, was really just a small outdoor wooden iron roof tub that would fill with leaves on windy days. I could now make out the roar of the bath fire. Misa, fanning herself about the collar with her cloth, returned to the room and casually plopped herself down at the tea table. My, was last night hectic, she began, as if to continue a previous conversation. Hamamura had just arrived and was on his first drink when Yura showed up. She said she'd gone into town for the night. Hamamura was in fine spirits, and Yura too had already had a, quite a bit to drink. I, I tell you, she sure can drink with the best of them. So then she tells me I should go to Nita to check on Mother, who's bedridden with a cold. Hamamura liked the idea too. Go on, he said. You're not wanted here. I'll stay behind and take care of little Miss Yura. How about it? You can trust me. I ain't that bad, he says. So I agreed to go check on Mother, saying that I'd be right back. But by the time I got to Mother's, her temperature had risen, so I had to call the doctor and buy her ice. When that was finished, well, the night was over. That Yura had spent the night with Hamamura did not come as a total shock, and it was even less surprising that Hamamura should be the center of such a scandal. Still, I was far from fine with all of this. A moment ago I said I was unable to make out Yura's face. Now, however, the two disheveled figures I had seen earlier that morning began to flicker vindictively before my eyes. Yura's clinging odor, which had over time permeated my body, began to oppress me, enshrouding me in an indefinable, unshakable gloom. Misa provided no comfort as she seemed somehow unperturbed by what had gone on the previous night. All I could do now was sit and sulk in this murky gloom of mine, better known by its proper name, Jealousy. Now what's the matter? Misa asked. You're sulking again. Aren't you going to finish your food? You know, you really, you know, you really had me worried there. I dropped by thinking you might be ho home, and what do I see but the gate flung wide open. I honestly thought there was a robber in the house. When I peeped inside, terrified, there you were all covered in mud and passed out in the dim light. My heart literally, literally skipped a beat. Ah yes, the bath. It should be ready now. Go on and get in. 
then you can you can fill me in on when what went on last night. While Misa tested the water, I've removed the clothes I had been wearing since the previous night, threw a kimono over myself, and proceeded to the back of the house where Misa sat stirring the bath water with a small bucket. It's a bit tepid, but get in. I'll kindle the fire. I removed my kimono, hung it on a low branch of the fig tree beside the lean-to entrance, and submerged myself in the warming water. Misa crouched down beside the bucket and began stoking the fire, averting her smarting eyes. Reclining against the rim of the tub, I gazed down at the sway of her fragrant hair, the marked whiteness of her exposed hairline, the slight shake of her shoulders, her springy thighs. Only air separates my naked self from her supple, writhing body, I noted. Whereupon I was immediately shaken by a powerful impulse that, to put it bluntly, was none other than unbridled lust. Had I been a brawny build, I would have proudly exhibited my stout limbs and ravished her right there on the spot. But as the thought of my puny body fills me only with shame, I instead remain shriveled inside the tub, my eyes madly glowing with desire as I choked on the powerful scent emitting from her body. That's, that's enough, I groaned. Right, she replied casually, enveloped in steam. Fanning the fire once more, she made her way out. Springing from the tub, I quickly dried myself off, pushed open the door, grabbed my kimono from the branch, and chased her down past the fig tree. By the time she noticed my encroaching footsteps and turned around, it was already too late for her to get away. What? Misa stood there frozen, unable to register, e unable even to register surprise, and immediately surrendered to my forceful embrace. She then, just then her eyes, just then her eyelids appeared to flutter ever so slightly, but this seemed not an expression of resignation or melancholy or any such inner emotion, but rather a reaction to the slight wind having lashed her eyes as she stood there in the clear autumn air. It seems my pen has come to a halt. Had I any desire to turn this little receipt into a full-fledged novel, I see no reason why I couldn't pull it off. How hard could it be to add a little embellishment here and there? And haven't my recent adventures provided me with plenty of stimulating and gripping raw material? Then again, any hope of writing a proper novel was lost the moment I pressed my pen to the page. Otherwise, that novel I had intended to write, the one about the old woman, which I alluded to in the opening lines, would be banished, would be finished by now. Many of you will no doubt laugh at my feeble effort, wondering if this silly portrait is all I can muster. But I say this, in order to go on writing, I first had to get this out of my system. This was my necessary starting point, the proverbial cork that had to be pulled to get to the sake stored in the barrel. And though it just so happens that my barrel swishes with nothing but lurid stories of this wretched world, if I ever catch myself leisurely paring my fingernails after having traced in the stolid manner of the so-called naturalists onto a thin sheet of paper the smut of this world, then I would no sooner snap my pen in half and join the local drunks in a round of rotgut. My aim, you see, is to elevate all this ugliness to the realm of the strange and fantastic. You may wonder, then, why I was unable to accomplish that here. The reason is that, well, certain circumstances have, and this is most difficult for me to admit, especially after this flamboyant rant, rendered the task impossible. Though it pains me to discuss this with you, and by you, of course, I mean not the average reader, but rather you esteemed individuals who have patiently and carefully followed me up to this point, let me try to explain. You see, for some time now I have suffered from that febrile disease known to the ancients as nympholepsy. As my condition shows no sign of abating, everything I write runs the risk of sounding like an eclogue sung by the goat god Pan, the mere mention of whom makes me blush with shame. But now that I have so thoroughly unburdened myself, there is nothing left for me to write, and so I shall abruptly terminate my little recit here in media res 
as I see no other way of wrapping it up. That it, ha that it had to come to this is largely the fault of my unsteady feet, which had me prancing around in frantic pursuit of one thing after the next, preventing me until now from recognizing this goat god that dwells inside of me. Now, if I could just regain my composure, renew my spirits, and subdue this lewd fiend, perhaps then my pen will churn out something that might withstand your criticism, my dear readers. Or is this just another of my conceited fantasies?